Okay, thank you and welcome. So today's shi'ur is dedicated by Hinda Levi in honor of her granddaughter's birthday, Imuna Etta Bas Saratova on the 7th of Nisan. Thank you for your dedication and you'll see how fitting the dedication is. Be'ezos Hashem, she should, when you hear the shi'ur, Be'ezos Hashem, she should grow up to be like her name, to live like her name. Um, and if you'd like to dedicate a shi'ur, please be in touch with either Dea or myself. My mom died eight years ago. I never actually believed she'd really die. And it wasn't only because every time during the years when she was really sick and it seemed like touch and go, she rallied. But also because we were so, 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 so close. We were, it felt as if we were connected by the spiritual umbilical cord. And I thought, well, if it's severed, then what will happen to me? Today, I think the answer to that is that it's not a cliche when they say, a mother's love never dies. Be that as it may, I was bereft. And as for my father, my parents were totally, totally devoted to each other. Some people have like a wide circle of friends and they're always going out with them. My parents just wanted to spend time with each other. They were totally devoted to each other. And when my mom died, my father was a shell of his former self, if even that. Now, those of you who Rahman al Sain have had to sit Shiva will know that during the week of Shiva, we don't wear new clothes or, or, or wash, put on a shower. And some opinions say that this applies to the entire period of Shloshim, the 30 days following a parent's death as well. And I held by that opinion. Now, my mom died on the 18th of Adar, but because Pesach is on the 15th of Nisan and a Yom Tov, cuts short a shiva or a shloshim, my shloshim, instead of ending on the 18th of Nisan, ended Erev Pesach, at Katsois at midday on Erev Pesach. I don't think I need to describe the Erev Pesach Balagan and Rush. And if you're looking at me now with a blank face thinking, Deborah, what are you talking about? I have everything ready by 11 o'clock in the morning and then go down and go and have a nice rest so I can be fresh and revived for the Seder. I don't want to know about it. In my home, Erev Shabbos is a rush. And so you can imagine the rush. Here I am rushing forward to prepare the Seder. And at midday at Katzeis, I jumped into the shower and then rushed off to, to the hairdresser to have my hair blow dried because I was so short in time. It would be much quicker for somebody to do it rather than me wash and blow dry my own hair. I still feel sorry for the person who had to wash my hair after it not being washed for a month. I did give her a good tip. But... I had my hair blow dried and I came back home and my dad said to me, Devora, your hair looks really nice. And I burst into tears. It just felt so surreal. How could I be doing something so normal, like having my hair blow dried when my mum was dead? And I was sobbing and my father was sobbing and the two of us were just sobbing un uncontrollably and we were inconsolable. And as we were both sitting there crying and crying and crying, I thought to myself, oh, Gewalt, now what? Now, usually one eases back into things. So one goes from the cocoon of Shiva into the Shloshim into the 12 months, slowly getting back into normal life. But Shiara was going from the Shloshim right into a Chag, the Samachte Vachagecha. And not only was a Chag, but we told we have to be happy with it. I was going back into Pesach. Now, Pesach is a Yom Tov where we're told we have to wear our, our finest clothing and our, use our best crockery and cutlery because we have to be regal, like princes, like princesses, like royalty. And I was feeling anything but that. But as I sat there sobbing, I realized that Hashem had given me an incredible gift with this timing because Pesach, is known as the Chag, as the festival of Emunah, of faith. And Seder night in particular is known as the night of Emunah. It's this night that if we know how, we can tap into this Emunah and infuse ourselves with this, this Emunah to give us this boost that will take us through the entire year. And so what I'm going to share with you today is some of the thoughts that I shared with my father that night, to give us chizuk that night, to give us a boost in Amunah. And these are ideas that I draw on daily 
to this very day. Before we do that and discuss how Pesach is the Chag Abayamunah, I want to take a step backwards and discuss the Jewish concept of time. Now, if you were here for the last year, you'll remember it. But because we're in the world of Zoom now, and I don't know who's heard, heard the previous year, who hasn't, I'm going to repeat this. For those of you who have heard me speak about it quite often, and you're going to think, you might be thinking to yourself, Deborah, I know this verbatim by now, including the jokes. Good. It's an important concept. So I want you to know, to know it off by heart. So what is time? Let me share my screen with you again. You'll recognize this and we'll have a look at this. And it's not sharing my screen, sorry. Let's stop the share and try this again. Share. Okay, good. Now we've got it. Sorry about that. So as, as we spoke about before in the past, in the secular world, time is linear. If we look at some important dates in world history, we've got Napoleon becomes emperor, slavery is abolished, and the Lindt Chocolate Factory is founded. But these are all dates that have absolutely nothing to do with each other. They're just dates on a, they're just dates on a continuum, on a line. Jewish time is different. As Rabbi Dessel explains, Jewish time is like a spiral. So if you look at this, these are all our Jewish dates. That's year one, year two, year three, going up and up and up. Now, what happens is when we, these, we travel through the year like that. Can you see as my pen's going? And what happens is as we travel through the year and we get, we recapture the energy. We return to key moments of the past and recapture the spiritual energy. So it's not that we celebrate the Chagim, the festivals as a time of remembrance, Rather, we return to each festival's origin in time and that holiness that existed at that time of the very first Pesach or Rosh Hashanah or whatever it is, that influences us today. So if you look at these little red dots that I've got, and I've got the 15th of Nisan, which is Pesach, imagine these little red dots are a shaft of light. So as here you are, you're traveling through the year, you're going to hit the shaft of light. Now, what is it? So what does this mean? These festivals are meetings in time. So as we travel through this annual cycle, we're going to meet these festivals. The word for, for a festival is a hug, but it's also moedim, moed, which means a meeting place. So what it means is that the different festivals, the different months of the year, even the days, as we know from Svarat Ha'ome, have their own energy. In fact, the word for or time, zman in Hebrew, means appointed or designated, because every single moment in time is designated with its own spiritual energy. So what is it that we meet every year on the Chagim? Each of these, of the festivals, has its own spiritual energy that enables us to grow. It's an opportunity for growth and connection to Hashem at the time. So think of it as a gift. That here, here you are, the Chag is giving you a gift, okay, and this gift is this energy of the festival, and that can give us inspiration throughout the year. So if we're attuned to it, it's ours for the taking. So what does this mean? As we've explained in the past, say you want to recreate a certain part of your personality. Rosh Hashanah, which is the time when humans were created, is the best time to do it. It's not to say that you can't try to do that at another time during the year. But if we tap into the energy of Rosh Hashanah, it will give us a head start. Likewise, Shavuos, we accepted the Torah. If we want to renew our commitment to, to the Torah, sign up for a shiur or something like that, Shavuos is a good time to do it. Pesach, we talk about it being a time of our freedom. We were, we were released from bondage in Egypt. So if you find that you're enslaved to something, you're addicted to Facebook or, or food or whatever it is, Pesach's a good time to kick the habit. But there's more to Pesach. It's not only the festival of our freedom. Pesach, as I mentioned earlier, is also called the Chag, the festival of Emuna, of faith. In fact, the Nesivas Shalom calls it the Rosh Hashanah of Emuna. So it's the new year for Emuna, for faith, so to speak. Hazal tell us that it was solely on account of our Emuna, of our faith, that we were redeemed from Egypt. And in the future, it will be solely on the account of our Emuna 
that we will be redeemed in the times of Mashiach. Which means that the gift that we receive on Pesach is the ability to tap into this font of emuna. So if we know how to do this on Pesach, we can then tap into it and entrench this emuna in our lives. So how do we do that? How do we tap into this energy? We do this through the mitzvahs of Seder night. Now that seems strange. How? How does sitting at a Seder table eating some matzah and singing Vahisha Amda in Trench Emuna in our lives. So when I was in seminary in Israel, I heard a beautiful analogy by Rabbi Zevlev. There's one little problem, and that was that I was at Sem 29 years ago. So to put this in context, the analogy, when, he, when I was there, my parents would fax me, to communicate, my parents would fax, and my granny would send me an aerogram. So he gives the analogy talking about two computers. I don't know who remembers, even remembers this, and needing to transfer information from one computer to another using a cable. So there weren't even USBs in those days, totally the dark ages. So this is his idea, but I've updated it for the 21st century. My phone pings, and it's a WhatsApp with source sheets for a Zoom shi'ur I'm going to attend later that evening. Now, because I'm still, I'm Gen X, I still like a hard copy of source sheets, and I want to print out these source sheets. So I hit the little print icon on my phone. My phone then connects through a wireless network to my printer. It connects to this, and it prints out the source sheets for my shiro that evening. Now, it connects, my phone connects to this wireless network, to do that through a password. Is it just me? Or did you all start off 20 years ago with one very basic password, six letters, all lowercase. And now 25 years later, you've got about 25 different passwords because now it has to be eight letters and has to be a mix of lowercase and, and high case. And some say it has to have a numeral, others say have to have a special character, but can't have a, an apostrophe or, a, or a, a colon. And you end up with like 30 different variations and end up locking yourself out of your accounts all the time because you can't remember. Was it just me, <laughs> your password? Anyway, be that as a way, May. My phone transfers the information to the printer by connecting to this wireless network through a password that has one numeral, one lowercase capital, and one exclamation point. And what do I have? Source sheets. The 15th of Nissan is our font of emuna, and we have to tap into it. Now, how do we do this? How do we get that emuna? How do we get these source sheets? By connecting through this wireless network, through the spiritual plane, through the mitzvahs of the night, which is Matzah Maror and Sipo Yetzirah Mitzrayim, telling the story of Egypt, of, of the Exodus. And so now we can understand what's the big deal with all these pernickety measurements. You may have noticed in your Haggadah, it will say, here you have to have a kazais of matzah, and here you have to have half a kazais. So if you've got a guide, it might say, here are 20 grams of matzah, here are 30 grams. If you're ill, you can have 15 grams. But why? Why can't we just eat how much we, however much we want? Because if you have a lowercase letter instead of an uppercase letter, you're not going to be able to print. You might still be wondering, how does this actually work? How is this going to instill emuna, or, or, the, or you'll actually see how we're meant to feel as if we've actually left, left Egypt? It's subtle. We're dealing with things on a soul level. And so we, you know, in our human bodies, we may not be attuned to what's happening. But the same way that if I, who am totally not techie at all, if I look at the back end of a computer program, what am I going to see? I'm going to see ones and zeros. I'm going to see binary code. Now, I've got no clue what that binary code is doing, but if I want to actually use that program, what I see from my side, I can use the program. So just because I don't understand what all that binary code is, doesn't mean that I'm not getting the advantage of the program. And so it's the same way it as we might not understand, what do you mean? How is this working? It doesn't matter. But as a Hashem on our soul level, this will also produce results. A word of caution. 
don't be dismayed if you wake up the morning after the Seder and you don't feel like the paradigm of Emona, especially if your house is upside down and you're on four hours of sleep. There'll be a shift, but it will be subtle. And Emona is a constant and lifelong journey of working on it. And that can also help us understand something else we're told. We're told that we have to retell the story of Exodus, Sepo Yetzias Mitzrayim, but it says further, you might remember this from the Haggadah, it says, Kol hamar saper. okay? The more we discuss the Exodus, the more we praise, the more praiseworthy it is. But why? We don't find this with other mitzvahs. For example, if I light Shabbos candles, it's not more praiseworthy that I then light Shabbos candles again. In fact, I'm not allowed to light Shabbos candles again once I've lit Shabbos candles. So why should that it be like th that way with telling this with the Haggadah? Haggadah? That we, we meant to talk and talk and talk uh, all, all the different ideas. So then the Siv Shalom explains that the, the, this opportunity that we have is imbuing emuna in our in our hearts. And because emuna is infinite, so we can speak about it infinitely on and on and on and on. And, and that's what it says. It says in the Haggadah, it says everybody, it will say we're all, it says even if you're a Chacham, even if, if you're never, whoever you are, even if you're a wise, wise person, you're still obligated to speak and speak and speak about the Exodus, about our redemption. Why? Because everybody needs this boost in Amuna that Pesach, the Pesach can give us. So the more we talk about it, the more praiseworthy we are. And the more we can tap into and get this boost of Amuna. And just a suggestion, which I do, I actually have post-it notes in my Haggadah. So when we get to a point that I really feel is a point that will help me focus on Emuna, some of the ideas that I'm sharing with you tonight, I have a little, little post-it note in my Haggadah to remind me to really focus on it when I get to that point. Likewise, the parts in the Haggadah where it says are an opportune moment to daven, and I use that time to daven to Hashem and say, Hashem, please help me, help instill Emuna in, in me. So therefore, the goal of the Seder is to instill Emuna in instill in Munis that, that we can take it with us to the rest of the year. And that's what we spoke about when we spoke about last time for the Purim. We said it's not that Yom Tov we commemorate an event, rather, we take the spiritual energy, we take it as a time for spiritual growth that we take from that night, from that day or, or week, whatever it is, and to take it with us to the rest of the year. And we gave the example of a Karen Linakosid who'd spent who'd spent Yom Tov with his Rebbe. And somebody asked him, how did the Yom Tov go? How did it pass? And he said, it didn't go. It didn't pass. It came inside me. It became a part of me now. And I have it with me forever. And so that's our goal. That's our goal with Yom Tov. So now, what are some of the ideas that I shared with my father that night? Let's start with matzah. Why do we eat matzah? There are different reasons given, but the most common one that people say is that we didn't have time to bake bread. We left Egypt in such a hurry that we didn't have time for the dough to rise. But we have to ask ourselves a question. Why not? Moshe had told them that we're going to leave. So why didn't they have bread ready? And to really understand this, let's ask another question. Have you ever heard of a Jewish mother? who doesn't send their child off to camp or whatever on a little journey with plenty of nash, okay? With some South Africans, I'm speaking to Australians, so I think I've, they're probably kind of, kind of South Africans who'll understand patkos, which means like fo food for the journey. But that's what a Jewish mother does. They, they, they little kinder have to have, have food at all times. So in 1994, a group of Hasidic girls went on a trip with their with their school. They went on a, a class trip to the forest, and one of the girls got lost. And the entire community was galvanized into looking for her, and they were very, very worried because for anybody to be lost in a forest would be dangerous. But for a city, a little Hasidic city girl who had no idea of how to fend for herself, it, it would be absolutely treacherous. After two days of searching, Baruch Hashem, she was found. And the policeman who found her offered her something to eat. And she said, no, thank you. She said, I've got plenty of food in my backpack. She's been lost for two days and she's got plenty of food in her backpack. What's going on here? 
So what had happened was she brought a backpack with her and not, but not all of her friends had, but all of her friends had food because all their mothers had packed just a little something, just a little bit of nash for them. And she'd offered to carry it for them. So she had all the, just a little bit of nash, all her friends' food. And so she had enough food to keep her going for two days and more. So I ask you, how is it conceivable that the Jews didn't have food with them? Moshe had told them ahead of time that they were leaving Egypt. So what? So why they should have packed and prepared food and have been ready to go? What is it that they were had to rush at the last minute that they didn't have time to bake? Damn. The Jews expected to leave Egypt right after the plague of blood. So yes, they were packed. They had their bottles of water and their smoked salmon bagels and their little Ziplocs with cut up fruit and vegetables and their slabs of fine Swiss chocolate. And the plague of blood came and went, but they didn't leave. Sfardea, and they got ready with their cartons of fruit juice and their salt beef on rice sandwiches and their nuts and raisins and their, slips of, their slabs of fine Belgian chocolate. And the plague of frogs came and left, but they didn't go. Kinem, they came out with their Tupperware, and this happened again and again and again. Says Rabbi Friend, by the time that the plague of the firstborn came, they didn't believe that the end was imminent. They had, a, I've been there, done that attitude. And so they didn't pack. They did not prepare. They did not bake. They did not believe. And I thought about this because I have to say, I think we women do very well on their monastics. And in fact, it's told that it's because it's the merit of the righteous woman that we were redeemed from Egypt because they had Imuna and they continued having children, even with the threat of, of the, the baby boys being drowned. And throughout the ages, we've seen that women excel at Imuna. So what happened? I think that perhaps we can give it a name and we can call it burnout. Just feeling so, so tired. And I can vouch for this after 28 years in Shidduchim. Yes, I have a minute that I can still happen. But let me call it a minute with a different flavor. It's an amuna that's tinged with pain, an amuna that's tinged with caution, an amuna that's, that's weary. It's not the same amuna that I had, that vibrant amuna that I had when I was 20. And I think we feel this, we can all feel this way. We start out, whatever it is, with that emuna, with that enthusiasm, with that excitement. Yes, we're going to get the job of our dreams, the spouse of our dreams, the child of our dreams. But what happens? We send out job application after job application, only to receive a you have not been shortlisted email. These days you don't even get that, you just don't get a response. We go on shidduch after shidduch, painting our face with makeup and a smile, only to find that Mr. Right Enough is so, so, so elusive. We go from one fertility treatment to another, only to deal with another failed IVF. We get that child, but take that child from an educational specialist to psychologist to psychiatrist, only to have him remain frozen. And maybe it's not that you don't believe but you're just so, so tired. You're burnt out. And if I think of current events, I know that Moshe can come every any moment and I want him to come. But if I think back at my life and I think back to when I was, was 13 and I think of the Gulf War and it seemed there were scuds falling everywhere and it seemed like Moshe was knocking on the door, but he didn't come. And then 10 years later, 9-11, when the world was upside down and topsy-turving, and you thought, surely now we're hearing the footsteps of Moshiach. But he didn't come. And then after that, in 2014, do you remember when the three boys 
were kidnapped. Do you remember the actus in the world? It was abs- it was palpable. And there's there's an, there's an idea that that the war of Gog and Magog will be will be this was June, and there's an idea that the war of Gog and Magog will be fought on Hoshana Rabbah. So that year, when I went to Rosh Hash- to Israel for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I stayed much longer than usual, a full week after Sukkot, because I was convinced Moshiach was coming, and I wanted front row seats. And at the start of Corona. When, when word on the street, or at least word on WhatsApp, was that this is Hevle Moshiach, this is the birth pangs of Moshiach, I really thought this could be it. But he didn't come. And two years ago, when Russia invaded Ukraine, in the 1700s, the Vilna Gaon said that before Moshiach comes, Russia will become a superpower. And he said that when Russia invades um Crimea, this is a sign that Russia has reached its peak, and he said that we should hear the bells of Moshiach, but he didn't come. And since October the 7th, when I feel like we're living in a surreal world, and the only the only way out is for Moshiach to come. And as this world war has stretched from a week to a month to over half a year, you know, I had it. I had it all planned out for Hashem. I said, Hashem, okay, I get it, that you wanted this to stretch out for a bit because we needed all this achdus and we needed Baruch Hashem. We've seen all these people coming back to connecting with these Yiddishkeit. Okay, I can understand that we needed it and Baruch Hashem, we've got it now. So I said, okay, Hashem, Purim, IDF can find the hostages. They can produce, They can give us Sinwa's head on a platter and it will be a modern day Megillus Esther, and that will pave the way for Moshiach coming during Nisan, the month of redemption. But the hostages are not home. And I want to believe that Moshiach is knocking on the door and that any moment we'll hear the shofar sound. But I'm burnt out. Yesterday, I don't know if there was a solar eclipse in America, and I don't know if anybody saw, but I got so many what messages uh, quoting uh, prophecy from Yoel about an eclipse and Moshiach coming and a Zohar and all these different, all these different things that it's a sign that Moshiach's imminent. And it's not that I disregarded it and I said, oh, nothing. But when I read it, it was a different flavor of Imuna. It was an Imuna, a tired Imuna, a weary Imuna. A burnt out emuna. Comes the matzah on Seder night and says, Yeshuas Hashem keheref ayin, that the salvation of Hashem can happen in the blink of an eye. It could be that yesterday the odds against this something happening was astronomical, but today is a different day. Today it might happen. And that is how redemption works. The Exodus was a paradigm for all for the future redemption. It is always the darkest before the dawn. You want an antidote to this burnout? It's eating the matzah on Pesach. The Zohar tells us that matzah is the food of emunah, the food of faith. When we eat matzah, we eat, chew, and swallow faith. On Seder night, we do yachatz. We break the matzah in half and put away the larger half for later, for the afikomen. Now, we said, and then we'll tell the story. We said that matzah represents our redemption, our because we didn't have time to, to bake. But matzah has another name. It's also called lechem oini. It's called the bread of affliction. Because we, it, it's a poor man's bread, and it's reminiscent of what we had to eat when we were in, in, in Egypt. So we find it's interesting. The matzah is symbolic, okay, both of the slavery of our ancestors as well as Gula, as well as this redemption. Why this dichotomy? Rabbi Hilschechter notes, and he says he quotes a Mishnah, and the Mishnah says that just as we recite a bracha on good tidings, hatov who is good and who does good. Similarly, 
For bad tidings, we recite a bracha, Baruch Dina Emes, blessed is the true, true judge. Now the Gemara is confused by this because it says, the, it says the, the wording, just to and simile, it seems to equate the brachas. But the two brachas have nothing to do with each other. It's the two different brachas. It's like saying, just as I recite a shahakol nihye bedvaro on a glass and a cup of coffee, so too do I recite lehad likna shel Shabbos on Shabbos candles. The two brachas have nothing to do with each other. The Gemara answers the question by saying the brachas do have something in common, that they should both be recited in a state of simcha, of joy. Why should they both be recited for simcha? One's good tidings, one's bad tidings. Rabbeinu Yonah explains that we ought to have emuna, the faith, that everything that Hashem does is for the good. While the wording of the two brachas cannot be the same, because from our human perspective, we are experiencing a tragedy. At the same time, we're expected to believe that Hashem would never allow anything objectively bad to happen. Therefore, we should say the bracha of Baruch Dayana Emes in a state of simcha, which if you remember from a few shirim ago when we discussed what simcha really means, you'll see how well, how nicely it fits in here. And we see this idea throughout the Seder. We eat maror at the Seder. Now, when we think of maror, we tend to think of, as, as South Africans especially, and not many Australians coming from the same part, whether it's South Africa or also back to Lithuania, we, we think of, of horseradish as being ideal. But that's probably because that was what was readily available in Lithuania. And the Mishnah actually lists five different herbs that would be that are good for maror. But it says that the best, the most ideal is chazeris or chasa, lettuce. Now, why? The Gemara says that lettuce, which is referred to as chasa, it, and why is it the best? Because it says Hashem was chasa from the Hebrew meaning pity or, or having mercy on the Jewish people when he redeemed them from Egypt. So they say, while it definitely, it's the bitter, evokes bitter memories. At the same time, when it, it also reminds us of Hashem's mercy. The Gemara says, eat lettuce, chasa, mishrim, shechas, rachmana, because Hashem treated us with mercy. So thus we see the Mara also represents the slavery and the salvation. And we'll see this again. In his commentary on the Haggadah, the Abar Benel focuses on Manish Tana. And he says, what's happening in Manish Tana? You've got this apparent contradiction of the symbols on Seder night. So on the one hand, we have the matzah and the maro, which we said, subjugation, destitution. On the other hand, we've got the dipping and the leaning, which is royalty and freedom. So the poor confused child says, what's going on here? Are we slaves? Are we free? And the answer underscores the entire Seder night. And interesting point to prove this is what I'm going to share with you now. I've read almost identical commentaries in different Haggadahs, but on different parts of the Seder. So the Barbanel explains that by acknowledging this dire subjugation, one comes to truly appreciate the salvation. So the Beis Halevi, the Briska Rav, explains this, the value of contrast, and he quotes a bit of a cryptic Midrash. And what, what's the Midrash? It says that Moshe says, Moshe says, with the word as I sinned when I came to speak to Pharaoh, because there he says, Uma as, and he says, um, when I came to speak and I said that, that Pharaoh's done, done evil to this nation, so too, he says, Moshe employs the same word as when they get to the splitting of the, of the sea, and he says, as Yashir. So Moshe says, because when I complained about the slavery, I used the word as, now I'm going to use the word as when I sing praises to Hashem, as Yeshir. What's going on here? Moshe's not making a pun and saying no pun intended. What happened? When Moshe went to Paro, to Pharaoh, and said, let my people go, not only does Pharaoh not let them go, but the, he makes the slavery at worst. Now the Jews had to make their own bricks. So Moshe goes back to Hashem and complains to Hashem. And he says, Ma'az, 
He says, what's the purpose of the, this additional suffering? The answer only becomes clear at the splitting of the sea. If you remember, B'nai Yisrael were in Egypt for 210 years. Now, Hazel tell us that if they had remained in Egypt for 400 years, which is the length of time that Hashem had told Abraham they were meant to be enslaved, they would have gone lower and lower. They would have slipped down to the 50th level of tumor of impurity, and that would have been the end. There would have been no way if they had hit that level of them going out. So what does it do? Hashem, in his infinite kindness, he calculates the years of bondage differently. But to do that, he crams 400 years of slavery into 210 years to do so. Think of it as an all-nighter before an exam. When Moshe uses as, the word as, for the first time, he can't understand. He can't see any good. What's going to come from, from the suffering? What's happening? But when then he uses it a second time, and the repetition suggests that Moshe praised Hashem not only for the eventual salvation, but also for all the suffering that came before it, because also for those harsh conditions. Because if not for those harsh conditions, then no salvation would have been possible. And so that's what we see. And we say this also in Tehillim. He, he noticed when we say, when David Amelech says, um, thank you, you afflicted me for you, my salvation. David Amelech says to Hashem, thank you for my salvation, but he thanks Hashem for the afflictions beforehand as well. And there's a story, there's as Australians, not a story, it's a true, it's a true story. As Australians, you may be more familiar with it. The non-Australians, there's actually was actually a movie made called The De Niro Boys based on this incident. It was one of the more, more notorious incidents in British maritime history. Winston Churchill later called it a deplorable mistake. But in the late 1930s, many Germans, refugees, came to England and they settled in England. But at the start of World War II, the, the British government was worried that there might be spies. So they decided to send these German refugees to Australia for the duration of the war. There was a problem, though, and that was that the, the seas were infested with German U-boats, so no sailors were wanted to take to sail to Australia. So the British government came up with a plan, and that was they would release criminals from prison on condition that these criminals would then be the sailors and the crew of these ships, of the ship that would take the take these refugees, these German refugees, to Australia. Now, it was under absolutely horrific conditions. There were 2,000 people, most of them Jews, who were crammed into, into this tiny this ship with really, really a history. If you go into Wikipedia, you'll see history documents what happened. I want to share another part of the story with, with you. I've heard the story many times. I heard it once from Rabbi Jeremy Golka, who I worked with, and he actually verified the story. If I remember correctly, he'd gone to pay a shiver call to the son of one of the people whose father had been was one of the people on the boat. Now, these criminals were criminals for a reason, and they subjected the Jews to terrible things. And one day they decided to raid all the Jews' possessions and take the valuables for themselves. But the Jews had no valuables. So the sailors, these criminals, were so, so, so angry. In their rage, they threw all the, the Jews' suitcases overboard. Now, not only were these Jewish refugees, many of them were children, teenagers, who had come over on the kinder transport. What did they have? in their suitcases, maybe a photograph of the parents who they'd left behind, or a recent letter or two. In 1980, 40 years later, a captain's logbook of a, a captain's log, a captain's logbook, he was the captain of a U-boat, was discovered and something amazing came to light. This captain had tried to attack the Danura, the ship, but hadn't succeeded. So he decided to wait until dark and then he was going to try attack again. 
But a few hours before, the sub needed to come up for air, and members of the crew noted that there were some suitcases floating on the water that the ship had obviously, the dinera had jettisoned. So the captain of the U-boat interest was piqued and he said, come, and they brought in two suitcases into the, into the U-boat. And what did they find? They found clothes with labels from German stores and they found letters written in German. So the Jews who'd communicated with their, their family in, in Germany had not put in any Jewish re references so that it would get through, cens through censorship. So what happens? This captain of the U-boat believed that that ship was filled with German prisoner, uh, peer, prisoner of war, prisoners of war. So not only does he not attack, he radios all the, the U-boats in the area and says, do not do not attack under any this boat under any circumstances. Not only that, he personally escorts the Denira to make sure it reaches Australia's shores safely. For 40 years, can you imagine how those Jews felt? Really, Hashem? Really? It's bad enough you murder our parents? but that you took away our one tangible memory of them? Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine the bitterness? As this story became public, the refugees realized that what they'd experienced that day was the hand of Hashem. They saw a vicious crew who threw over their belongings to the, those photos of their parents in their anger, in their rage. Now they understood that if not for that act, 2,000 Jewish lives would have been lost. What had seemed bitter was actually Hashem's salvation. And we see this message throughout the Seder, be it the duality of the Matzah and Maror, or within the Haggadah itself. Rabban Gamliel would say, that we have to discuss the following things on, on Pesach, Pesach, Matzah, Maror. And the Svas Emes asks the question that chronologically it's out of order because Pesach, the Paschal sacrifice, that came after the Maror and the Matzah. So he says, why? Why is it chronologically out of order? And he explains that the bitterness is only understood after the redemption. While it's happening, it seems bitter and hopeless. Now, we've said this so many times in Ashia Rim, but just to reiterate, we're not saying there's no pain. Event, events are painful, but one day we'll be able to look back on it, and it might not be in this world and see that, that good, the good that came from the good. And sometimes we can even see it in this world, how things We'll see, go through something painful or bitter, but then we'll see how it refined us, how it made us better people, how we changed because of it. And I remember for myself, something that really made an impact on me. It was after I'd had chemotherapy and I was just beginning to have, con be able to concentrate to read again. And I read Chicken Soup for the Survivor's Soul. And one of the stories really made an impact on me. And it was a line at the end. And it was written by a girl um, who had had to have who had had cancer and had to have her leg amputated. And she ends off her story by saying she, that she'd been very, she'd been very shy girl before and, you know, just didn't want to take part in anything, didn't want to, to do anything. And this is the sentence that gave me so much encouragement. She said, cancer gave me a courage I'd never had before. The courage to conquer with one leg, what I once couldn't even face with two. We all have our struggles. That was li what life is all about. But Rabban Ganimliel's message is don't lose faith. Just as B'nai Yisrael were eventually able to see, wow, they could understand, they saw Hashem's salvation and could even appreciate why all that suffering, why that servitude was necessary. He says, Be'ezos Hashem, so too will we one day be able to look back at all the pain, all the suffering and understand why it was necessary. Along the same idea, we have karach, the, the sandwich, when we eat the matzah together with the marrow. And we read 
in the Haggadah that at the time of the Beis HaMikdash, Hillel would take the Pesach and he'd take the Matzah and Maror and eat it all together. He'd wrap it all together and eat it as a sandwich. So in the Palace Gates Haggadah, they quote Rabbi Shlomo Kruger and they ask, and he asks why. Why do they say Hillel? I mean, maybe other people did, but why specifically is Hillel the person who decided to do this? He said they should do that. And he quotes the Gemara. And it says that one day Hillel was coming from a journey and he hears cries coming from his from the city. And he says, I am certain that this, this is not coming from, these cries are not coming from my house. So, and it goes on and it quotes from verses and it says, evil tidings, he fears not, his heart is firm and confident in Hashem. We have to ask a question on that because we see even Yaakov fears Esau. He says, what? He says, how can I be sure Hashem's going to protect me? And also we know, Emun and Betochen doesn't mean that everything's going to be fine and hunky-dory, that everything's going to work out just as we want it. Emun and Betochen, having trust in Hashem, means that we trust that our, we know that Hashem does whatever is best for us. That's what we believe. Whatever transpires in our life is for, is, is for the good, even though we don't understand it. If we look at the Gemara again, doesn't say that, that Hillel was sure that nothing had happened to his house, but he was sure that the cries were not coming from his house. The Maharsha explains that Hillel used to teach his household, the member, the family, his family members, that whatever happens is for our best, is coming from Hashem who loves us and doing it for our good. And that's why he was sure that it was the cries that were not coming from his house. So if we look at it, we've said that the Pesach, the Pesach sacrifice alludes to good. We said matzah can have a dual, can have both, but in this case, we'll talk about it alluding to the good. And maror, at face value, we say is bitter. So what is it? Hillel, Hillel, who was the one who understood that everything is really Hashem's loving kindness. Okay, he was the one who was best suited to wrap all these illusions and say, Everything is for the good because to him, all the illusions were equal, were good. And Rabbi Yaakov Klein explains, he says, when Hillel covered the bitter maror with the matzah, okay, which, and here we're saying, okay, we're saying that the maror here we're saying alludes to the good. He was demonstrating that all of suffering is ultimately couched with and surrounded by Hashem's kindness. Now, this faith that we have, it does not negate the experience of pain from the human experience, from, from the human experience, okay, from the human perspective. We still have those, the, the bitter herbs are not excluded from the sandwich. But the understanding is that although we might not be able to see it, all the maror, all the bitterness, the pain that we experience in our lives is surrounded, is couched by this matzah by Hashem's goodness and kindness. So what does this do? It enables us to respond to pain differently. This sandwich, Hillel sandwich, enables us to embrace this, this paradox, this paradox of the one and of Hashem's loving kindness, but also our human experience of, of evil, of pain. You know, this year, you know, in, in particular, we, during the year, we, we, we've experienced this overt presence of evil. And what we're seeing or not seeing is Hashem's concealment. But on Seder night, we close our eyes. We close our eyes, the rest of the, the, the physical eyes that we have the rest of the year. And we look at our, the world through these emuna eyes. And we can perceive a higher reality where we see all this bitterness, all this pain, all this struggling, the suffering is all for the ultimate good. And indeed, let me see if I can share the screen now. Okay, let's see. Let's look at it. Let's look at the, the sandwich in Hebrew, korech. And if we look at that word, it's actually made up and we split it into two. The first part, the chaf and the vav, if we look at the gematra, okay, and the vav is six and the half is 20, it gets 26. Now that number should ring a bell 
26 is also the gematria of Yud K Vav K, one of Hashem's names. Now Hashem's names have different meanings, and that name I'm not going to say it because I'm not going to say it out loud. But that name, the, 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 the Yud K Vav K, represents Hashem's kindness. The Hebrew word Rach means softness, comfort, consolation. So what does this mean? This is the message of the sandwich. Although during the year, we might not be able to readily perceive this, on Seder night, we lift up our tear-filled maror eyes and we're able to perceive it and we take in what is it really? We're surrounded by Hashem's name of kindness on the one side and his comfort and his consolation on the other. In a similar vein, I had a beautiful idea from Rabbi Meir Biederman. And he says, the laws, we know the laws, that when we eat, eat um, the, the, um, the maror, we don't lean because the maror symbolizes our servitude and the bitter and the painful things. But when we, um, and while the leaning is freedom and royalty. However, when we eat the Hillel sandwich, the Karak sandwich, we lean. So why do we do that? And he says, when one wraps his maror, his pain, his suffering in matzah, which, as we said before, is, is the Zohar tells us, is a muna, is the food of a muna, and one understands that everything Hashem does is for the good, he says, this will nullify the maror. And so we lean. And as we approach the end of the Seder, we get to the Afikomen. Do you remember right in the beginning of the Seder when we broke that piece of matzah in half for Yachatz, we really had to employ our faith that something good was going to come out of the shattering. And again, too, in this Korach sandwich, we, we had to, and we, yes, we felt it, and we, we, we tried to believe that, that everything was for, the, for this ultimate goodness. But come to Tzafon, when we eat the Afrikomen, we actually get the chance to taste it we actually get to taste and understand that all our pain, all our failures, all our sufferings, all our downfalls, it's all for the good. It comes a stage in life when we're suddenly struck by this deep and hidden awareness. Safon means concealed, that it couldn't have happened any other way. We realize that the ascent did not come despite of the descent, but because of the descent. We realize that because we hit rot bot bottom, that's what sparked, okay, the journey of recovery. It wouldn't have happened any other way. The Jews, this, with this, without that suffering, without that slavery in Egypt, we would never have been able to receive the Torah at Harasina. In this flash of otherworldly awareness, we understand that everything was part of Hashem's master plan. Everything was good. The title of the shiur is the Seder, Night of Emunah. And when I sent out a reminder, somebody responded and said she was looking forward, but she said, if you had to change the shiur to the Seder, Night of Simcha, I wouldn't argue. Life feels heavy at the moment, but I didn't change the title of the shiur nor did I change any of the content, but I hope that I fulfilled her request. There is no greater simcha in the world to know that we are wrapped in Hashem's loving kindness. Seder night and always. Okay. Um, before I take any questions, if anybody has questions, I just want to make note that this is the last year we're resuming, but as just a I think only in about five weeks' time, mid-May. Um, so Adair or I will send, and I will send out reminders when that happens. But just to let you know that as just a for the Sphera, for the 49 days between Pesach and and Shavuos, which we told is a time of personal growth, I'll be as just a sending out daily recordings. Just some of you have 
taken part of it, my weekly recordings, recordings before. I always try, I always find that when I start off a program and there's too much, there's a bit of overwhelm. So these are going to just be very short three minute recordings with something very easy to implement each day. So if you'd like to join that, it's in the WhatsApp. If you look at the chat, the WhatsApp group um, community to join is in the chats now. You're welcome to join. It's free. There's absolutely no charge. And if also once this is, it goes onto YouTube, I'll put the, the link again in the comments section. As I said, please share feel free to share it with anybody else who would like to join no charge if you would if you would like the opportunity to, to dedicate though be in touch with me um any questions or just then thank you very much yeah you thank can take you. the recording out now uh, if you want okay. okay fine so let me just stop this recording um